there, was born in Germantown, Pennsylvania, and at the age of two moved to, to Lancaster County, a small town called Ephrata, Pennsylvania, which is uh, kind of a farming community, uh, which is where the Pennsylvania Dutch and the Mennonites, uh, that culture uh, predominates, I guess. We had a fairly solid upbringing. We were taught the difference between right and wrong. We were expected to do certain things. My father expected us to maintain a certain level of discipline around the house. Uh, my mother uh, never had any formal education. Worked at various jobs throughout her life. And my mother had been married previously uh, to a man who got killed in a car accident. My dad's been a truck driver all his life. Never had any formal education either. I mean, he was a, a tough-minded individualist who always seemed to find it easy to stand up for what he believed in. In fact, at times, reveled in it. Not that his was a crusading spirit, but he was not averse to a fight. And from time to time, he would even boast about his integrity and strength of conviction, which had a way of irritating some of the what I refer to as weak-willed men and the types around us. My brother Ray and I responded very strongly to my father's self-esteem, which resulted in our becoming staunch individuals. I can remember a number of occasions when people would when people referred to the mentors, my father, my brother, as arrogant and conceited, which only served at the time to fuel my nascent individualism. Actually, we were not arrogant or conceited. We were just proud of ourselves. My father, who, while not an intellectual, learned something about the value of knowledge in the course of his life and sought to inculcate that value in me. Um, I can remember he would reward me when I did well in school. He would give me one, money or gifts. I remember one time he gave me a $20 bill, and then another occasion he gave me a baseball bet. So he helped to encourage my continued hard study doing well in school. My father, again, was always proud of the, the good marks that I got in school. He would brag about me to his friends and other relatives. That, that's bound to have a strong impact on the kid's mind. The other influences were a few teachers who were intelligent and benevolent enough to identify the fact that I had a good mind. The effect that my father, or these specific teachers, had on me by applauding my mind was the greatest childhood influence I had in looking back, without a doubt. Uh... I was never considered a bookworm as a, as a youngster. As I got a little bit older in my teens, I started becoming more bookish. But never the typical bookworm type, I don't think. I don't recall ever being called a bookworm. Uh, I, I started to read a lot of the TV as often as I can. I was very athletic, as, as a matter of fact, I played some junior high school football very well. did well in track. I did extremely well in swimming. I was the physical fitness champion of our high school four or five years in a row. I was always out in the backyard doing push-ups, sit-ups, and jumping fences, climbing trees. And I enjoyed all that stuff, but that ch all of that changed immediately when I discovered bodybuilding. It's the proverbial story. It doesn't even sound real, but uh, I happened to cross one of those muscle magazines on the newsstands. And uh, believe it or not, Steve Reeves was on the cover, the Hercules guy. And uh, the very moment I laid eyes on that magazine, I knew what uh, my destiny had in store for me. Really, it was just instantaneous. Well, my dad bought me a set of weights. It was all I had access to for a while. And I, I trained by myself for, oh, perhaps a year or two was making noticeable progress by the ages of 14 and 15. As a matter of fact, I had some photographs taken at around that time, maybe I was 15, and I was already looking like a well-developed advanced bodybuilder without steroids. That's when I, I knew. I can remember 
I was very impressed at one point by how my development was proceeding, and I thought, geez, I'm really starting to look like those guys. There's no reason why I shouldn't continue. All, all I have to do is make the commitment and I'll do it. I didn't know anything about genetics at the time. Probably other young men get, have that same notion, but not being a genetically well endowed, they don't make it. But it, I, it so happened that I did. As my father saw my continued interest, my interest continuing, he suggested I meet one of his lifelong buddies, the guy that he was very close with in his teenage years, this man named John Myers. And uh, I was invited to train with him three times a week, along with his training partner and friend, a man named Russell Hurtsod. Russell was primarily an Olympic weightlifter and John a power lifter. They had a big influence on my early training. They had encouraged me to train heavily, not just in bodybuilding, but Olympic lifting and powerlifting. I, I like both of those. I, I consider myself, and looking back, not just a bodybuilder, but a strength mm. athlete. Actually, I continued training with them for several years. John was good enough in 1965 to bring me to New York City from my hometown of Pennsylvania. He was the first Mr. Lumpy contest. I was very fortunate I got to see Larry Scott win the first Mr. Lumpy. That had an enormous impact. I can remember that. Serving to fuel my ambition to go further. I can recall watching Larry Scott arrive people going literally crazy. Seeing Larry Scott was, was almost a religious experience. I remember after the contest, I was determined to get backstage and see him. So I climbed up a fire escape, and lo and behold, I ended up walking right into the dressing room where Larry Scott and Dave Draper were. And I, I stood there and gawked while he wiped the oil off of his enormous arm. I clearly recall being even more impressed by his calves. I had never seen a professional bodybuilder before. Seeing his calves from behind while he was drying the oil. I got so excited I couldn't contain myself. Larry was quite friendly and then mm -hmm. uh, as he was leaving the, the guards ushered everybody out. I, I had to go down the elevator with he and Dave Draper. That was exciting too and then upon leaving there were still people outside waiting. I got that impression again as, as to how exciting it must be to mm -hmm. have fans waiting for you as you're leaving the hall. As a matter of fact, I can remember I can remember sitting down with Muscle Builder because that was the IFBB magazine and deciding to go into the IFBB at some point because that's where the Mr. Olympia was. I can recall taking a pen and on one of the pages inside the Muscle magazine writing down Mr. America underneath that Mr. Universe, underneath that Mr. Olympia. And I, I had placed next to each of those titles. I wrote down the year that I planned on winning them. I may have been 14 at the time. I don't recall the year, but it it was the Mr. Lancaster County Contest. I lived in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. They had their, their annual contest. Uh, it was my first contest, and I won rather handily. I had beaten some of the guys from the city who I used to look up to. And there were quite a few good bodybuilders in that area. Yeah, I must have been about 18. A year after that, at the age of 19, I went into a state contest that's in Pennsylvania and won that rather easily. At that point, I was starting to look real good. When I was 19, I started using steroids. I had been taking a couple of Dynabol tablets a day and it helped out quite a bit. But I was training up to three hours a day, six days a week. But at the age of 18, being young and restless and wanting to escape the remaining of my, my dad, went into the Air Force for four years, which is why I ended up in Washington, D.C. Well, at age 20, I was pretty screwed up, as many young men are. At that period, I was in the Air Force and really didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be a doctor and a bodybuilder, but I uh, hadn't seen that much of the world and felt as though I had to have a certain amount of worldly experience before I pursued anything. I joined the Air Force to see the world and ended up in Washington, D.C., about 150 miles away from my home, so I didn't see a whole hell of a lot, but it was a big city, and I did become more worldly. I 
went from there to the teenage Mr. America and got second place, winning all the best body part awards. Well, as a matter of fact, I was good enough to go into Mr. America. As a matter of fact, I did at the age of 19. 1971. That was the year that Casey Theater won. Casey won all the body part awards, best arm, best back, best leg. I got second in the best, best arm, best leg contest. Casey was very, very impressive. He is, uh, I think, a couple months older than I am. But I remember being extremely impressed with him backstage, <clears throat> pre-judging. We all stripped down, and I saw this 19-year-old kid looking like Mr. Olympia. I went through the roof. I couldn't believe my eyes. But he was, he was impressed by me too. As a matter of fact, he approached me and told me how good he thought my genetics were. I didn't understand that term at the time. No one had spoken about it much with regard to bodybuilding. And uh, he suggested I call his mentor, Arthur Jones. I do recall the first time I called him, he wasn't in. But he did call me back. The theory that he advanced back in the early 70s, the theory of high intensity training, whose principles are that exercise has to be intense, brief, and infrequent, is universally valid. Right after the Mr. America contest, where I placed 10 behind Casey, I injured my right shoulder rather severely during a set of flat bent dumbbell climbs. I could not train for almost eight months after that. I couldn't raise my arm from my side. In fact. During that eight months of inactivity, I became disheartened, a little bit depressed about it all. Didn't know how to direct my efforts elsewhere. Ended up getting not fat, but more overweight than I should have. And after the Air Force, I stayed there for three more years, really kind of uh, floating about aimlessly, not knowing quite what I wanted to do. I had gone into school, and I went to Prince George's County Community College for a while, it's right back there, by the way, in a philosophy class. And then uh, went to the University of Maryland for a while uh, in a pre-med program. But there was still this thing in my mind about bodybuilding. I had to get that out of the way first. And then finally in 1974, it became evident that bodybuilding was starting to take off as a popular sport with Arnold's success and then pumping iron. And I knew I wanted to make it, so I, I put my foot down. I said, look, I don't want to end up 50 or 60 years old and look back and say, well, gee, I could have done that, but I didn't try. I decided in 1974 that I was going to go back into it. And just... Just, uh, just for the purpose of getting back into a reasonable condition, not with the idea of competing. Started training again three days a week, just a couple sets of body parts. And in no time at all, started ballooning up and decided that uh, you know, perhaps it was time to start thinking about competition again. Um, I stayed in the Washington, D.C. area and went to school for right around three years. I was studying pre-med. I was taking biology chemistry, some mathematics, things that might get me into medical school. My goal at the time was to become a psychiatrist, as I had always had the fascination with the mind. I remember at that time I was reading a lot of Freud and R.D. Lang. As it turned out, I did not finish college. As a matter of fact, in part due to Joe Weider. I didn't compete in 74. No, I'm sorry, I didn't. I competed in small shows at Holyoke, Massachusetts. As a matter of fact, there was a Junior Mr. America contest I won up there. That wasn't bad. Right around 190 pounds. Which wasn't bad for a young bodybuilder at five foot eight. That got me very excited. I thought if I could win Junior Mr. America in the ISBB, of course the next step was the Mr. America. And in fact it was, in 1975, Franco Colombo put on the Mr. America contest here in Los Angeles. And I placed third behind Robbie and Roger Callard. I came out here actually expecting to win. Uh, but uh, upon reaching backstage and seeing Robbie Robinson swallowing real hard, I I realized that I was not going to win. I, did, I didn't take it hard either. I, upon seeing Robbie, I just, well, whatever happened, happened. If I didn't win, I didn't really care about second or third. 
I knew Robbie was going to win, was going to win, and he did very handily. It was an important show, however, because that's where I met Joe Weider. I remember very clearly being backstage, pumping up before the pre-judging, and I, I couldn't get over the fact that Joe Weider was back there, and he seemed to spend all of his time staring at me. I was literally shot, and I thought, gee, I, I knew I looked good, but I didn't think I looked that good. And then he was actually very kind and gracious. He walked up to me after the contest, invited me to a photo session. That was Saturday, which was uh, the next Monday morning, at a studio in downtown Los Angeles with, with Russ Warner. And he was very impressed at the photo session and invited me out to his offices the next day so I could do a series of four interviews with Dean Mose. Ended up as quite a spread in Muscle Builder, several pages with lots of photos. And I spoke at length about the high intensity training program. Even Dean, during the interview, uh, was quite surprised that I was only training three to five sets per body part two days a week. And then, of course, um, the magazine received quite a bit of mail after that. And I kept doing articles, and the more articles I did, the more response the magazine got, the more response I got. As it turned out, one of those photos from Rustin's photo session ended up on the cover of Muscle Builder. So I was ecstatic. I I didn't know it was going to be on the cover. I don't think Joe told me it would be. Uh, but it did, and I remember <clears throat> being at the newsstand in Washington, D.C., and running home and calling Joe and thanking him for it. He invited me at that point to come out here to California permanently to live and work perhaps. But I was still in college and turned it down. I went back to Maryland and did go to school. Um, very, very happy about that decision. Uh, but knew knew that I wanted to be the best. Uh, according to my own timetable, I had to win the next year or two. So I trained like crazy after this 85 yards with my brother back in Washington. Uh, trained very, very heavy that winter and improved enough to not just win the contest, but totally freak out the judges and people had seen me the year before because I gained 14 pounds of muscle. And they thought I was a different human being. They, could, they didn't even recognize me. I went from being a distant third to a very easy first place win, having beaten Roger Callard on every judge's scorecard but one, and that was Arnold. There were nine judges, and every single judge voted for me, but Arnold, of course, Arnold was Roger's training partner. I never felt more excitement than I did the night I won the America. I guess maybe because it is the first big contest, getting over that hump. But uh, I can remember, even before they called my name out, knowing I was going to win, and I felt the emotion rolling up in my chest, and I had to really keep myself from crying. It was such an exciting moment. And I remember standing on stage, being very, very aware of everything that was going on, the audience, people behind me, around me, and making a, a definite attempt to never forget this moment. Every impression, sight, sound, now everything. I still have that impression on my mind, that, that exact moment, everything, the feeling is great. But that was the beginning once you win the America. Or at least for me, it was. That's uh, stepping stone, a, a greater stimulus to continue. I went on to the 76th Mr. Universe in Montreal where Robbie won. I didn't really think I'd, I'd beat Robbie uh, until that night. I thought I had gotten a greater audience reception and people were coming up, Luke Ferrigno, Boyer Co, and said, that, hey, you could really win this thing. But uh, in the back of my mind, in my heart, I knew that there was no way I was going to beat this guy. Not only did I think he looked better, but he was getting all the publicity. And I, I noticed that Ben Weeder was introducing him to all the Montreal dignitaries in the audience. And he, he didn't even shake my hand, didn't even recognize my, my existence. It was the winner of seven. January, February, I was walking, oh, a quarter to a half mile between classes at the University of Maryland campus, and it was freezing. I didn't have any money. I was working for a doctor on the side. I had a girlfriend. I was just, just generally having a rough time of it. I was also becoming disheartened about the idea of becoming a psychiatrist. I was tired of being broke, so I called Joe 
um, and let him know that I was willing to come out if the invitation was still open, and it was. What I decided to do was, in June of that year, fly to that Vancouver, British Columbia, to compete in the Mr. North America contest, which was going to be attended by Joe. I did very well at that contest. I was outstanding and won, and Joe was excited again. Uh, it wasn't the greatest competition in the world, but Darcy Beckles and myself and my brother and a few other top names made it respectable. On the way down to California from D.C. in the airplane, we spoke at length. And I decided to... Make, definitely make the trip to California. Matter of fact, I stayed there with yeah. Joe. My girlfriend was still back in Washington, D.C. We had an apartment. We went about uh, making the arrangements to come out. He followed me a month or so later, and I ended up staying for good. Glad that I did. I had no regrets. I ended up living for oh, about a year or so in a building that Joe's aunt owned on Beverly Glen, West L.A., which I enjoyed very much. Kathy and I had a very good year there. Um, during the course of that year, my mail order came out and started doing very well. And the lodging was not spacious enough to accommodate the inventory. So we moved down the street. My first move here in June of 77, I was associate editor. I was in the office every single day. I only stayed in the office I continued working in the office for approximately, oh, maybe just six months. Once I was here and the word got out, I received, started receiving quite a large volume of requests for exhibitions. And because I was traveling all the time after a certain point, I just no agreed to just let me continue writing without having to appear in the office. Joe and I got along extremely well. Many people thought that he sort of looked upon me as a a son that he never had. He was quite happy to be around me and even proud I he would invite Kathy and I out to dinner. Oh, up to two times a week. He would invite me over to his residence on weekends and we would go to his library and talk about philosophy and art. I was very fond of him. And then the 77, of course, was much worse because I lost to Cal Scala, having been designated the favorite that year. But even that didn't bother me so badly. I've never taken defeat that bad. Cal was in very, very good shape, where I was definitely off, not quite at my peak. I've never been devastated by a defeat. I, I don't view defeat as failure. It's just uh, one, one step in the learning process. If I lose a contest, uh, as long as it's not due to political reasons. Then I analyze the situation, I analyze my physique, my performance, try to improve on it for the next time. But I don't feel as though I've been lessened or diminished in stature as a person because I lost to Cal Stalag or all these guys are great champions and losing to them is no big deal. But then having lost the 77 universe, I realized I'd better get my act together or forget about making a career in bodybuilding and came back in 78 and won with a perfect score. I knew that I had to win the 78 universe or kiss me goodbye, so I trained very, very hard in the 78 universe. Fortunately, did win that one with the first and only perfect score. In terms of personal satisfaction and elation, it was 
not what winning the Mr. America was. Winning the Mr. America involved a sense of achievement, triumph, that nothing else after even came close to. The universe was almost anticlimactic. Uh, there was no elation at all. Now that was just one more stepping stone to, to uh, professional bodybuilding. Having just won the 78 universe, my picture was appearing on the covers of magazines. I was appearing on national TV shows like Merv Griffin, getting a lot of publicity. I was making a lot of money. That was the high point, without a doubt. Matter of fact, the 1979 Southern Professional Cup, that was my first professional contest. I went there in top physical condition and also mental condition. I went there feeling the way I had felt for the 76th America. I knew that I was in my best shape and it would take off monster to beat me. Prior to the prejudgment, backstage when we were all stripping down, the one guy I knew that I had to worry about was Robbie. When I saw him strip down, I, I knew it again, just as I knew down all the way to my toenail that I was going to win the America. I looked at Robbie and I thought, there's no way this guy's going to beat me. I was very happy too because I was experimenting immediately prior to that for the first time with rest pause training. And it worked. I had cut my workouts back to only seven sets. That was one of my most heavily muscled conditions. I remember my muscles even feeling heavier. I just felt heavily muscled and more heavily muscled at that contest than at any other contest. And I was almost as ripped as I was at the 80 Olympia. I was very big and very hard. I thought I deserved to win. And I did, and I was very happy about that. A month or two after that, there was a professional contest in Pittsburgh, which I lost to Robbie Robinson. Actually, I had won the pre-judging. During the pre-judging, I was in the best condition of my life. But after the pre-judging, I made the mistake of going out and eating indiscriminately. At that point, I didn't understand diet and fluid intake as well as I was too later. I learned about it in part from the mistakes that I made after the pre-judging of that contest. During the pre-judging, I was absolutely enormous. My muscles were filled to the brim with glycogen, mm -hmm. and my skin was extremely tight, adhering to the muscles almost like cellophane. Deep striations. I thought, my son, I'm even better now than I was the last show, and I was better at the last show than I was at the universe, so everything's going well. Then I made the mistake, I remember going out right after the pre-judging and eating four or five pancakes, butter and syrup, drinking several glasses of orange juice, and then going to the, the final show that night and being clear, clearly aware of myself that something was not as it had been that morning. I was quite disappointed and I was afraid it would cost me the show, and ultimately it did. I had won the three judging with a perfect score there, too. I was ahead of Robbie Robinson, and I knew it. He, Robbie seemed disheartened. That night, enough to piss anybody filled her off. Although there was a contest after that Pittsburgh show, there was a contest in New York a month later, 79 Night of Champion. At that show, I was third place behind uh, Robbie Robinson and Danny Fidel, and I deserved it. Uh, it was right around that time that my mother became very ill and that particular stress on top of the stress of having just trained so hard for three shows in a row in a short period of time left my motivation lagging and I, I didn't even think about winning that show I had a contractual arrangement with the people that put it on and I went there for that reason not to win not thinking that I would or, would or even cared my, my mother's terminal illness was up most of my mind I can remember, as a matter of fact, uh, while in New York the night prior to the show, I received uh, some very bad news from the doctor. And uh, Kathy was there and was kind enough to help keep my emotions under control. She ended up dying two weeks after that contest. And uh, that hurt me very much because right at that point in my life where I was becoming successful and had the money to give her to travel with me perhaps to Europe. I, I wanted very much for her to leave our hometown at least for a while and come out to California to have to travel. She didn't live long enough. And, uh, 
uh, that hurt very much. I went into quite a bit of a depression and stopped training actually for about six weeks, during which time I ate way too much, put on way too much fat. I lost almost all of my motivation. It was towards the end of June, six weeks later, six weeks after the New York contest. I finally decided if I was going to go on the 79 Olympia, I better pull myself out of that rut. I was in the worst condition I had been in years. I, I was barely looking like a bodybuilder. I was flat. I had lost considerable size. There was not even a hint of abdominal definition. So I went through my mental gymnastics. I started revving myself up, whipping myself up into a lather. Finally became very tenacious, put my foot down, went on a diet, started hard training for the Olympia, which I think was in October of that year. I went myself into pretty good shape, although I can recall very clearly this is an interesting one. Three weeks before the contest, my brother Ray looked at me and said, Gee, Mike, you've had a rough year. Our mother died. So everybody will understand. Why don't you just put it off? That didn't deter me. It didn't even prompt me to think that I wouldn't make it, although it, it gave me a little bit more of an incentive to put. The last three weeks before the Olympia, I improved 300% can put such a quantification on it. I was training very hard up to that point, but that last three weeks, and, I, and this is the way it usually goes, even with most bodybuilders. The last three weeks, last three or four weeks, you pull out all the stops. You know that it's going to be over soon, that you can take the punishment, that you're going to give it everything you possibly can, and I did. I kept voluminous notes, and I poured over my notes over and over again, and I kept daily records. I knew how to watch the patterns in my weight gain, the body water level. I worked all that out, and I knew I'd be ready for the 79 Olympia, and it worked out. My idea was confirmed. I woke up that morning. Everything that I thought would work did work, and I was in the best condition of my life. There was no subcutaneous fat, or at least it was so little it was negligible. If I went into that 79 Olympia, knowing that I was as big as I'd ever been, but considerably harder. Thought even at that point that I could be Frank saying I thought that my shape and proportions were equal to his, and that I would be considerably bigger. There was no reason why I shouldn't beat him. And I almost did. I did win the three judges with another perfect score. Won my weight class, placed a very close second to Frank Zane overall. I thought, if they want more definition, then I'll get even more rip than I was the year before. So I paid more attention to diet all year long, which is something I hadn't done before. I usually waited to start dieting, oh, 10 or 12 weeks before a show. I started dieting and doing aerobics in February of that year. I think the contest was in October. I carried my purpose, my goal around with me 24 hours a day since 1980. I can remember no matter what it was I was doing, taking the garbage out, going to the post office. Everything I did had a heightened sense of meaning because I was constantly thinking about that 80 Olympia. What was it could I do today in terms of diet, training, aerobics, motivation to improve myself? In addition to heavy training, I was doing a lot of bike riding and even running. And then at different points, a lot of posing. I was physically active almost all day long. And everything that I did was marshaled onto the side of the crew, and I probably even at a couple points pushed myself too hard. I remember three times before that 80 Olympia, which is something a lot of people don't know, I pushed myself to the point where I literally did, did almost die, but I thought I was going to die. I had drained not just my glycogen levels, also my uh, ATP. When I woke up in the morning, three different occasions, each separated by several weeks of leave. When I literally thought that I had done some irreparable damage to my body, I remember literally not being able to lift my arm without being left breathless. That I had pushed myself past the point probably very few human beings have ever done. I placed too much value on winning that contest. That was in Sydney, Australia, 
I remember most clearly was Josh Lomar. The day before the show at uh, Paul Grant's gym, he was very concerned. He was concerned that his friend Arnold was going to destroy his legend. He was very, very concerned, as his friend was concerned. He told me that, in fact, Arnold told him he was going to go on the show and how he tried to talk him out of it. So it didn't bother me to hear that he was going to go on the show, especially in lesser condition. But it didn't seem that he had been in good condition. It wouldn't bother me. The morning of the show, the atmosphere was much different. There was a tension there. There was a hostility and negativity that, that skewed everyone's normal perception and, of course, prevented anyone from deriving the pleasure they might have had otherwise. Everything was askew at this point. It was not a normal contest. No one was talking or acting as the, the way they used to do. There was a strain and tension in the air all the way through. And the issue of the weight classes came up. And there was a lot of arguing going on. Arnold and view of the guys. I, I wasn't even concerned about that. I didn't care one way or the other. I, I thought I could win. It was a very large room. There must have been maybe 50 or 60 people in there. And Arnold, as usual, wanted to be the center of attention. But he had said something to denigrate Samir Badu in front of everyone, something that was uncalled for. He was making a fool out of himself, but at that time I wasn't concerned. I thought if Samir Badu wanted to defend himself, that was his business. So he was going through his annex. At one point, Boyer Co. stood up as a gentleman and said, look, why don't we just let Arnold explain to all of us right here, right now, what his reasons are for wanting to have two weight classes. Maybe we can get to the bottom of this instead of arguing aimlessly. And he did say it in a very gentlemanly fashion. There was no hint of malice or anything negative in his voice. And Arnold that back, oh boy, or why don't you stop acting like a baby, grow up and be a man, which I thought was uncalled for. So I said, look, Boyer Co. said that as a gentleman, something to that effect, he doesn't deserve that. You just accused Boyer of acting like a baby when in fact you're the one who's acting worse than that. And that pissed him off. He turned and he it all come on, men, so we all know that you lost last year because of your big spelling. And I allowed that to irritate me perhaps too much, and on impulse, I ran over towards him. I scared him. Arnold Schwarzenegger sat down. I continued at him. I was wagging my finger at him, telling him that his, his behavior was reprehensible, that it was not boy or co who needed to grow up. But then only once I stood up at the free judging meeting did that thing come to at least a partial halt. That irritated Ben Weider. He stood in between Arnold and I and tried to assert himself. But it became very clear, especially later on as the day proceeded, that things weren't the way they should be. In 1980, I placed fifth at the Mr. Olympia a contest that I and almost everyone else who witnessed it was convinced was fixed. Well, my immediate gut level reaction was, uh, paradoxical as it may sound, was laughter. I just started laughing. It was ludicrous to me. It was so obviously an incorrect decision that my first response was just to laugh. It's interesting, at the 1980 Olympia, the only people who saw Arnold as the winner were the seven judges and his closest friends. None of the other competitors saw him as the winner. None of the audience, or very few, only those that were his friends. If it was just me saying this, of course it could be chalked up to sour grapes, although that's not true. I've lost contests before, I never raised a fuss. But that particular contest was so clearly fixed that every other competitor and many of the fans in the audience raised a fuss. And of course, the, in the aftermath, all the magazines carried articles pertaining to the fact that it was fixed. In some ways, I'm glad the 80 Olympia turned out the way it did. 
it brought into clear focus for me really what the political establishment and bodybuilding is really all about. For years I was walking around in a fool's paradise. I thought everyone was as nice a guy as I was. I thought that evil was something you just read about in novels and newspapers. When in fact evil was something that's around all of us. This brought it all into focus and I didn't want to be involved or associated with people like that and decided to drop out. There was a, a rift after the 80 Olympia. Actually, it wasn't so much Joe as Ben. There was one time when I was in the office and a phone call came in from Ben Peter for me. During the course of the conversation, I can remember yelling at Ben. He was not appreciating some of the things that I was saying about the ISBB with regard to the 80 Olympia. And, uh, I remember Joe grabbed the phone. Why are you yelling at my brothers like that? And Joe took, took the phone and talked to Ben. And I could only surmise what Ben said, but whatever it was, Joe's response was as I was standing there, what do you want me to do, Ben? Put a muscle on the guy? I was talking a lot. I was saying a lot of things that Ben didn't like. And I suspect at one point Ben got very irritated and told Joe to cool it with Mike Menster. And there was cooling after a while. I was actually driving myself into the ground in addition mm -hmm. to my training. I was writing articles, doing a lot of reading and studying, doing seminars and exhibitions. And that's what led to my taking amphetamine. In 1979, I started getting amphetamine from a doctor, not for the purpose of getting high. That was the furthest thing from my mind. I didn't like getting high, as a matter of fact. I had stopped most marijuana many years before. I was taking amphetamine as ergogenic aid. I, I loved being productive. I would wake up every morning at four o'clock and read literature and philosophy for a couple, three hours, go to the gym. After that, come home and write an article, go back down to the beach and ride bike for 40 miles, come home, take a nap, go back down to the beach area and run three to six miles, then come home, pose, do some more studying, answer phone calls, do some business with a mail order. But I didn't realize that I had lost sight of fact that the body and the mind has limitations. I was I I was in love with being conscious. Amphetamines have that effect on a lot of people. I had read some of the literature on it. Uh, I had never heard of any long term physical damage, but I did know that it could possibly result in acute episodes of psychosis. I had studied that years ago as part of my interest in the mind in psychiatry. But I was convinced that I was focused enough. I was convinced that my energies were being channeled in a positive direction. And they were. I don't think there's anything wrong with working as hard as I did as long as you don't have to take stimulants in order to do it. A lot of people drink a lot of coffee every day and smoke cigarettes. Do whatever they can to stay stimulated and be productive. In 1983, I left Los Angeles, where I worked for Joe Weider and his Muscle and Fitness magazine, to go to Florida to work for Arthur Jones at Nautilus. I stayed there for a relatively short period, only six months, uh, which is quite interesting, actually. A year or two prior to that, I said to an old friend of mine, I wouldn't mind working for Arthur Jones, if only for six months, to get to see how his mind works. As it turned out, it was only six months and I left his employ. Went to Europe, performed numerous exhibitions and seminars. Came back for a short period, actually a year and a half. I published and served as editor of my own magazine, Workout for Fitness, which was a more general fitness magazine, soft core bodybuilding magazine, as I called it became the central focus of my life for a year and a half. I worked harder than perhaps I'd ever worked in my life, sometimes staying awake two or three days at a time to the production schedule. I think in our 12th issue, right in the middle of it, and I got a phone call one day that no more money was going to be given to Workout Magazine. I was left high and dry.
at that point, I was taking a lot of amphetamine, and that, on top of everything that happened, that left me emotionally distraught, did something to my mind that I'm fairly clear about today. Although these things are very, very complex, the combination of being emotionally distraught, which can cause an individual to lose conceptual control. Combined with amphetamine, did something to my emotional structure that led to my performing a number of irrational acts that got me institutionalized. On different occasions, for up to three months. But there was something going on in my subconscious. At that time, I did not understand the importance of philosophical consistency.、Uh, There were a number of contradictions working in my soul, and I didn't understand the nature of them. And the negative parts took hold. I was not being life affirming. At one point, I had ceased to care. I was suicidal a couple of times because I had nothing that I valued strongly enough. There was no forward direction. It was literally a day-to-day -day existence. There were periods of lucidity. For a while, I would be, be, be pursuing something in my mind, and I was convinced it was real. I would get institutionalized for it, but I'd be released to think, "Well, I'm right; they're wrong. I'm going to continue doing it, even if it gets me in trouble." I was convinced I was right. I was not in full conceptual control. Actually, the only person that was, why should they? Actually, John Little was quite important. He was one of the only two or three people who didn't approach me on the ignorant assumption that I was just literally a psychotic, not knowing what the term meant, therefore writing me off as not worthy of consideration. John understands quite a bit about the power of ideas, the way ideas work in the mind. He understands something about the relationship of the conscious mind and the subconscious. We would talk at length at times about all of this, and I I still remember those days quite fondly. And it causes me to think fondly of John Little. Now he approached me intelligently, again not on the assumption that I was psychotic, not knowing what psychosis even means, writing Mentor off as a loony or a crazy.、Mm -hmm. He knew that there was something going on in my soul that was very serious to me. And he, when we spoke, it was serious. There was no nothing smug. Not laughing at me. He's not. He didn't. He never thought I was necessarily even crazy. He, he was actually interested in the ideas. Some of the ideas were actually quite logical. The basic premises were way off. Thinking was actually quite sound on some of it. It is something I learned about later too. A lot of people have used logic brilliantly, but their basic premises aren't in reality. Or they build castles in the cortex. Their ideas have very little bearing on reality. I was still studying. What this is part that interests me the most. I was still studying philosophy. I understood what I was reading. Understood the importance of being in control of one's mind. But there was a lot I didn't understand. There were forces at work in my subconscious that I, I literally did not have an explicit understanding of. Ayn Rand points out that, that which is not explicit is not advanced control. I didn't have an explicit understanding of what was going on, and therefore I did not have full control. My ex-girlfriend was quite supportive too, emotionally and financially. Most other people, from what I understand now, just wrote that her office was crazy. Was not understanding anything philosophically about what was going on. Just an opportunity, as John Little pointed out, to say, "Ha ha, we were not so bad. Mike Mentor wasn't that great anyway." So by bringing Mike Mentor down, they kind of elevated themselves in their own eyes. People often laugh, mock, jeer at things they don't understand. One thing that does disappoint me is the fact that there were. So few people who seemingly made any spirit attempt to understand or extend any any support just spiritually.
I heard from almost, I heard from no one during that period. No one wrote me a letter. No one called. No one said, gee, I hope you're doing all right. Then again, with some people, I understand they, they, they didn't understand it. It was beyond their, their comprehension at the time. But that, that's what disappoints me a little bit. And again, it's reflective of our whole society. People really don't make an effort to understand. But it's also true, people have their own life dramas going on and things that are traumatic, stressful, and <laughs> have to deal with what Mike Mentor was going through, I understand, in several cases, just too much for them. It finally dawned on me that the phantasms I was pursuing were not real. Finally, the last institutionalization, I realized, hey, there's something wrong. There's too much of this. There's something going on in my mind here that's not right. And I gave it a lot of thought and realized that all of that stuff contradicted everything else I had believed in for a long time. And that's what was right. Get back to what you knew before, Mike Mentor. That emotional trauma you had with your father dying in the magazine and whatever else, along with the amphetamines, really did do something to your mind. And raised all of that and go back to what you did know for sure. I, I did that, and with, I was on to a almost immediate recovery. It was that full recognition that everything that started at a certain point in time up until that moment of reflection was literally not true. So I acted, I, I took that particular step. I, I acted mm. on the conviction that none of that was true. I ripped it out of my mind. That conviction was, was the turning point. I understand that very clearly now. Because I understand that very clearly, I can work more consciously to create type of soul or character I want. I know how to intensify the positive, rational, psychological process of the material. I know how to, what I refer to as denature or diminish the potency of the negative, irrational material. By taking a strong, positive, conscious, affirmative stand towards a certain mental content, we can be better assured that that will work in our mind for us in the future. When something, we find something negative in our focal awareness, we can also take an appropriate stand to consciously to denature it, diminish its intensity, diminish its potency, help ensure that that same psychological material will not work in our minds with the same kind of intensity it has in the past. This is the way that an individual creates his own soul consciously. I can't say I'm glad it happened. I learned a few things, but as with the bodybuilding period of my life, I, if I could go back, of course, I wouldn't go through it again. So, I mean, does it bother you that people have got a, a, a distorted view of what happened or events or whatever? No. Nothing like that bothers me anymore. Nothing, absolutely nothing like that bothers me. Uh, the ones who really care to take the time to understand will see it for what it is, nothing to hear at. And those who don't care, who are only looking to lower somebody else so that they can feel better in their own right, well, those people obviously shouldn't be of any concern. I was down at Gold Gym right away, seeking client. I started my own personal training business which started out quite slowly. I bring that up for those listeners who might be considering starting their own training business or who are having trouble now. I was quite surprised that it did start out very slow. I thought that with my visibility and name recognition, I'd move into that business and it would be a spectacular success right from the outset, but it was not. First four or five months, I only had a few clients was on the verge of giving up when all of a sudden it just started paying off for whatever reason it started to flourish. 
Um, talking about your career today as an athletic trainer, um, are, you, are you enjoying sharing your knowledge that you've obtained uh, over the years and sharing it with other people and helping them build their bodies? Is it giving you a lot of personal satisfaction? Yes, it is. I competed for, oh, up to 10 years. And uh, as you may know yourself, athletic training gets to be a little old as you get older yourself. Uh, but now I do enjoy sharing the knowledge that I acquired over the years of my own training with my clients. and. Uh, it's very, very satisfying. I've been quite happy with it now. Four years later, it's better still, in part as a result of my continuing my articles, Flex and Muscle and Fitness, and also as a result of several top bodybuilders finally recognizing that heavy duty, high intensity training not only works in theory, or it's not only true in theory, but that it works in practice. People like Aaron Baker, David Durth, David Paul, Lee Labrada, and last but not least, Dorian Yates. Prior to winning his first Mr. Olympia last year and since, he's been very kind to give me a good deal of credit. Apparently, he was motivated to start training as a result of having seen my photographs, hmm. having read my articles, bought and read my books. Not only was he inspired by the image of my physique, but he was brighter than the average bodybuilder. He came to understand the theory of high intensity training, recognized its validity, used it, and went on to win European, British championships, Knight of Champions, and now the 1992 and 93 Mr. Olympias. Many, many people who may have been wary, skeptical, even openly hostile to the theory of high intensity training are now not so much so. They're saying, geez, maybe Mincer was right, or at least he was on to something. If it worked for Dorian Yates and he and Casey Vieter and Ray Mincer, there has to be something to it. Mike, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, people out there who would like to improve their physiques and their bodies and would want to go to perhaps a trainer. But what, what should somebody look at when they are looking into getting a trainer? What are some of the yeah. qualifications maybe? Well, not necessarily his muscular development or even his athletic appearance. It's actually very difficult. Presumably the person's going to the gym because he knows little or nothing about training. Uh, I think the only way to do it would be to assess his general intelligence level and listen as to how well he explains the principles of productive exercise, as to whether or not he has a grasp of the principles of exercise. A couple of the, a couple of things that I've run across and while, while I've been training is that people generally want either two types of ways to improve their body. They either want to get more muscle mass mm -hmm. or they want to become defined. Talk about a little bit about the different theories between gaining mass, what right. you should do, and maybe if somebody just wants to remain lean and not really gain any, any mass. Good point. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are two, two types of basic training. You can train either for muscle mass or endurance, which tends to, to burn body fat and keep you lean. Um, for those who want to build muscle mass, the most important principle is that of intensity. The harder you train, the more weight you lift, the more you put into it, the more muscle you'll develop. Uh, and those who are looking to just remain lean and not develop muscle, perhaps tone themselves, uh, the intensity factor, the amount of weight they lift is not so important. They don't have to push themselves quite as hard. I had a standing policy as a young man of always looking for someone to admire, to look up to. That was, that was on the level of my sense of life, my preconceptual, emotionally integrated view of life. The, the, childhood equivalent of a mature rational philosophy. It just so happened my father was a heroic figure and through emotional associations uh, I came to admire and integrate people like my father, people who stood, who stood up for what they believed in and a tremendous integrity and that's been my policy now explicitly, not on the level of emotional subconscious but on the explicit level of a conscious, mature, rational philosophy, I am a hero seeker. I was a much younger man in my mid-twenties. Back in the 1970s, I was in my literary period. 
reading the <laughs> classics and just about anything I could get my hands on. And uh, by chance, I came across Atlas Shrugged in 1977. Read it more or less as a literary duty, enjoyed it, but was not overwhelmed by any of the philosophy. And then in 1980, I met a, a very impressive man, in fact, the most impressive individual I've ever met, a man here in Los Angeles named Rex Dante, fairly well, well known in certain circles here in Los Angeles as a philosopher. And upon first meeting him, I recognized that he was the man of the highest mind I've ever met. And I asked him how he got like that, and he said, Ayn Rand. And I knew the name, and he suggested I pursue my readings of Ayn Rand beginning with The Fountainhead, which I did read. In fact, that would have been my second book, of course, having read Atlas Shrugged prior. And from there on, I went to her nonfiction works, including The Romantic Manifesto, which, interestingly enough, is my favorite of all her books, as I'm not truly an artist. And The Romantic Manifesto is her statement on art. The Virtue of Selfishness, Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal, and many others. I guess I, I feel very fortunate to have lived in the time of Ayn Rand, and I've thought about that many times. Uh, I don't know where I'd be without objectivism, exactly. I, I was always intellectually oriented, but uh, there are a lot of people out there posing as intellectuals who don't impress me at all. In fact, uh, many intellectuals claim the title based on an anti-intellectual approach to the intellect, believe it or not. Nietzsche was the only other philosopher who stimulated me, and it was because of his sense of life he had a marvelous feeling about the greatness of man, which he groped to express explicitly, but never at the same high level that Ayn Rand was able to achieve. As soon as I began reading Ayn Rand seriously, after my meeting with Rex Dante, uh, it didn't take long before I recognized quite clearly that she was beyond the pale, well beyond the pale, an epical genius, if you will. The reality we live in is the only reality there is. Things are what they are. Learn to use your mind to identify those things accurately and evaluate them. Don't turn your mind into a distorting agent. Don't use your mind to evade the facts of reality. Confront reality as it is, which is the principle of justice. A is A. Things are what they are. Nature, in order to be commanded, has to be obeyed. Part of nature is your own mind. It has an identity. Learn how to use it properly. To the extent that you do, you'll be happy and successful. To the extent that you evade that knowledge, you will be unhappy and unsuccessful. Without a doubt. This is a wonderful endeavor in and of itself. There's a lot of self-satisfaction to be derived from recognizing that you were able to discipline yourself and use a certain amount of knowledge to take yourself from point A to point C, take your body from being average or below average to whatever it ultimately might be. But if you were to look deep down inside of yourself, get honest, what you're really looking for, even a businessman, somebody who wants to make a lot of money, a million dollars, they do want the money and that's fine and good, at bottom, the purpose of all goal achievement is to develop a sense of mastery, efficacy, to achieve a certain type of happiness that can only be had as a result of achieving goals. A lot of people find once they acquire the muscles they'd always dreamed of, they're not really different inside because they, they don't take this philosophical approach. The idea is to gain a sense of mastery, a sense of self-esteem, happiness, which can only be derived from achieving goals. You have to have that stated explicitly at the outset. If you think that you're going to end up having those things only as a result of having the muscles, and you don't work on developing other aspects of your life along with it, like your philosophy, then you're just going to end up with a set of muscles and be bereft of the rest. A lot of top bodybuilders, as top bodybuilders, of course, they have the big muscles, but they're self-arrested intellectually. They're no further ahead at the age of 30 or 40 mentally than they were 10 or 15 years ago when they started. They're psychologically beset by the same conflicts, the same sense of 
insecurity, uncertainty, self-doubt. They've got the big muscles, but they didn't get that sense of mastery. Self-esteem can only be achieved by starting the whole process by stating explicitly, not only do I want big muscles, but I want self-confidence. I can only get that by enjoying the process, gaining the knowledge, recognizing that I am a more effective person. It's interesting, as gratifying as it is to receive emails, phone calls, letters every day from bodybuilders around the globe, thanking me for helping enlighten them with regards to a valid scientific approach to training. Much more gratifying is the overwhelming response that I've had the last several years from bodybuilders, thanking me for introducing them to Ayn Rand, objectivism, <laughs> and the realm of the intellect.